I have to introduce you to today's second speaker, uh, Professor Heather Ann Thompson, who comes to us from the University of Michigan, where she is Professor of History in the Department of Afro-American and African Studies, the Residential College, and the Department of History. After Professor Thompson's first book, Who's Detroit, um, which I believe, uh, along with all the other books by today's speakers, will be for sale outside those doors, um, since her first book, over the past six years or so, Professor Thompson has redirected her gaze at the history of mass incarceration in the United States. And in the process, sort of within the world of uh, United States history, she has emerged as perhaps the strongest voice imploring historians and other scholars to pay more and better attention to policing and prisons. And within a broader public sphere, through writings in The Atlantic, The Huffington Post, among many other venues, has made a strong case for revising the history of late 20th century America based on what we now know about prisons, their costs, and the larger system of criminalization of which they are a part. So Professor Thompson's forthcoming history of the Attica prison uprising of 1971 and its legacy, book called Blood in the Water, won't be published until August, so I can't say much about it, except I can't wait. Um, a topic that's sort of long overdue for a big book, a big reconsideration. Her talk today is titled, Why Mass Incarceration Matters. So please welcome Heather Ann Thompson. Okay. So um, I want to get started. And one of the wonderful things about following Ruthie is I'll get to, I'm like the pilot that, you know, we're, we're taking off late. And I'll say I'm going to make up time in the air. Uh, to get us to the finish line a little bit more quickly. Um, because, uh, because Ruthie was able to give us some really good graphics, I will be able to, to um, maybe go a little bit more quickly because I don't want to repeat where we've been. Um, so, so all of us here are uh, here because we, I think, understand already that, um, that mass incarceration is really the civil rights crisis of the 21st century. And again, I want to just stress that not so long ago, maybe even three or four years ago, this was obvious to all the communities most affected by it, but it wasn't obvious to the nation writ large. And for that reason, part of me is tempted to just sit down because I feel like you know most of what I'm going to say. But I also want to just keep going because I think it's always good to touch base with and to be reminded why this is the civil rights crisis of the 21st century, and also hopefully in my talk to arm all of us with even more information to take forth in communities, even more, uh, even more of a powerful argument for why we need to do something about this, why we need to change this. And again, the good news is that I get to follow a brilliant talk that lays out the dynamics of this crisis. <laughs> I can just move on forward, uh, but I will make a pitch also for the Prison Policy Initiative, which made this graph. Um, um, also, yes, we are an international outlier. Yes, this is severely racially disproportionate, um, not just, by the way, for between uh, black men, white men, Latino men, and white men, but also for women, women, of course, uh, really uh, being criminalized and incarcerated uh, in severely racially disproportionate uh, ways as well. So I want to actually, and I want to just stop here too. Uh, when I do this talk a lot uh, around the country, I always feel really compelled to just spend a moment on this slide because there's always someone secretly in the audience wondering, they look at those racial disproportionality slides and they say, well, you know, mm, I don't know, is it true that some communities are creating more crime? You know, is that why the police are where they are? Shh, I didn't say it. So one of the things I do first and foremost is call that out and say, no, this is not a question of who commits crime, quote unquote. This is not a question of that. It's a question of criminalization. It is a question of policing. Uh, every college student knows that white people like their drugs as much, actually more, than black people. And that in terms of drug sales, that is also the case. So I just dispense with that as we go. So why does mass incarceration really matter? Well, it matters because it has completely, over the last 40 years, undermined our communities, destroyed and distorted our economy, and distorted, in ways really incredible, our very democracy. 
And I just want to walk through a little bit of that. And the way to really begin that is to talk about our communities. We know that the fate of our cities and already most marginalized spaces, even in rural communities, has been devastated by incarceration. But I want to take a minute to talk about that and to talk about um, how that happens, what the impact of it's been, and also why that happens. Because I think the why here is really, really important. Um, how it happens, as Ruthie Gilmore has made very clear, is through the criminalization of space. And I'm going to talk more about that in a minute, but before I even do that, I want to talk about why. You saw the graph. You saw that all of a sudden everything just goes crazy, really after 1972, but particularly after the 80s, everyone we start to lock everybody up. But why? Why now? Why do we begin to criminalize space in all new ways now? Well, if you ask most Americans, even today, the answer that they will give you is crime. You know, the 60s, you know, the 70s, you go into Times Square and it's a little shady and, you know, and things were, terrible things were happening in communities. And, you know, we may not like mass incarceration. We may not like excessive policing. We may not like the outcome we got, but we did it for a really good reason, which was out of control crime rates. And this is a popular, still a very popularly um, held view. And one of the wonderful things about being a historian is that we get to historicize things, in this case, crime. And uh, Khalil and I had the opportunity to serve on a panel where we studied this you know, in depth. And one of the really interesting things is that we did not actually lay the apparatus for the war on crime because crime rates were out of control. We lay the apparatus for the war on crime in 1965. And one of the most striking things about 1965, comparatively, when you look at things like the murder rate, let's just go, let's just go deep immediately, because you're either dead or you're not. Right? So you look at this and you see something pretty remarkable, which is that the crime rate in terms of murder is relatively unremarkable in 1965. And in fact, things had been a hell of a lot worse in the 1930s for really good reasons that we'll get back to in just a moment. If you look at the violent crime rate, you notice something else, which is that things get a hell of a lot more violent when we are knee deep in the war on crime. So whatever we're trying to do, if that's what we're trying to do, is backfiring in some really interesting ways. So why do we start the war on crime when we do? Well, there's lots of complicated reasons, and the scholarship on this is getting really deep and interesting on the complexity of why we do this. But one of the reasons why we do this has everything to do with the social movements in America. It has to do with the civil rights movement. And just in a really quick explanation, you know, when we had the civil rights movement down south, it was really easy for northern politicians and even some federal politicians to say, well, you know, yeah, all those crackers down south, you know, yeah, let's go down there. Let's maybe knock some heads. Let's, let's reinforce some voting rights. Even then, it was a struggle to get them down there. But let's just say it was easy to displace whose problem it was, right? It was a southern problem. But then in 1964, right, Philly explodes, Harlem explodes, Rochester explodes. And then all of a sudden, for the northern politicians, it gets a little bit more complicated. Well, well now, wait a minute. We're not racist. We don't have problems with race. So therefore, those people in the streets are thugs. They're criminals. They're destroying the social order. And by the way, they start to sound exactly like Sheriff Bull Connor, who was talking all about the criminalization, the, the acts of criminals and thugs in the streets of Birmingham. And in 1965, President Lyndon Johnson, not Nixon, creates the apparatus for the war on crime. And then we just add to it and add to it and add to it. Every president, every party, it was bipartisan. But here's the real message. It was a policy choice not a crime imperative. And that's crucial, right? Because if you choose something, presumably you can unchoose it, as opposed to being dragged into something that you had no choice. I want to make the point, because I am a historian, so we're going to get the history lesson whether we want to or not, is that we have been here before. Right after the Civil War, of course, we had four million newly freed people who also had claims on the polity and on jobs and on housing. And the response across the South was criminalization of space, criminalization of black spaces across the South. And so very quickly overnight, you look at something like the Georgia State Penitentiary that was 
pretty much 100% white in 1864, by 1894 is almost 100% black. And it's not because white folks stop committing crimes, and it's not because black folks lose their minds, it's because we have made a policy choice to respond to freedom through the criminal justice process, to create new order through the criminal justice process. And so in that sense, what is old is, is new again. We then add to it. You all know about the drug revolution, the revolution in drug laws. But you may not have necessarily thought again about this connection to timing. It's very notable that the most sort of infamous original drug laws were the Rockefeller drug laws. Rockefeller promotes these laws in 1973. This is not coincidentally related to the fact that he puts down the Attica uprising in 1971. This was his line in the sand. We are not going to coddle criminals. We are not going to coddle addicts, not what treat them through the public health system. We're instead going to criminalize them. We get the Rockefeller drug laws. They are added to, I am from Detroit in my state. We get things like the 650 lifer law, where you have 650 grams of cocaine, automatic life sentence. Doesn't matter whether you were just in the car. Doesn't, you know. So this is what we add to. And adding to it is devastating. And excuse the error on my slide that is meant to say two decades, not one decade. We have a catastrophic leap in the number of people who we arrest on drug charges. And see, I told you, we're like the pilot. We are now in Cleveland. We are, we are scurrying through my slides. Um, and what you notice about the drug arrests, again, is who are we criminalizing? We are not criminalizing the drug lords, quote unquote. We are criminalizing people for possession. And possession, many times, is a euphemism for addiction, right? Or is it associated with addiction? People who have low-level amounts of drugs on their possession, usually because they are users. And again, just to drive home this racial disproportionality uh, point, because we want to understand where we get it, this chart is a powerful chart on marijuana possession arrests. And again, you don't need to talk to too many white folks before you understand that white folks also enjoy marijuana. Um, and you notice very quickly on these county by county basis that the disproportionality is staggering. And this is in places where marijuana possession is illegal, but as you can clearly see, it is illegal far more for some than for others. Okay, so we also get this mass incarceration because we start locking up people longer and longer and longer. And I tell my students, they're like, you know, oh, you know, you such and such did this crime, you know, eh, give them 20 years, 30 years. Like we hand out years, like, you know, candy. When I do this talk in, you know, in other countries, they're like, what? What? 2015? Like we feel like if someone gets 10 years, it's like, they got off easy. You know, a decade of your life. Meanwhile, I tell my college students, it's like, you're in college right now, and you can't even begin to imagine the end of four years here, can you? <laughs> so you're going to get your degree. Like, this is an incredible amount of time. Not just how much more time through mandatory minimums, but things like more life sentences than we have ever had in American history or in any other country on the globe. But also juveniles, juveniles serving life without the opportunity for parole. Now, you know, the Supreme Court says in 2012, you can't do that. You got to let children have at least the chance to get out of jail, to get out of prison. And in my state of Michigan, in my previous state of Pennsylvania, I used to be at Temple, um, you know, we held the dubious distinction of having more children serving life sentences without the opportunity for parole than any other state. And prosecutors in both of those states fought tooth and nail to make sure that that Supreme Court decision was not retroactive. I mean, this, this falls into the special place in hell category. Um, but in any case, finally the Supreme Court says, no dice, you must give these kids the opportunity. But this is the environment we're dealing with, right? We are dealing with the most punitive culture in, well, like I said, we've been here before in a long time. So we lock people up longer. We keep them entrenched in this system longer than anybody else. Seven million people, more than seven million people entrapped in this system in part because we have a probation and a parole and, or not parole, I'm sorry, a probation system. You can't get out of it, right? And we also have one of the highest recidivism rates. And we're going to, in a few minutes, it'll be another one of those dumb, like, well, of course we do. 
because the system is intended to keep on churning, which I love that phrase that Ruthie gave us. Um, we also have fed this through, as we all know, through the criminalization of schools in devastating, devastating fashion. Again, police in the schools, right? I mean, that's just a thing today. Everybody has police in the schools. Well, guess what? We didn't have police in the schools. Prior to 1940, there's one exception to this. Interestingly, Los Angeles gets police in the schools in 1948 for very deeply racialized reasons. But Detroit, 1968. Baltimore, 1969. Atlanta, 1969. What's happening here? And where did the police first go? They go into the schools with the most civil rights unrest. In Detroit, you know, there's the Northern High School uprising where they want a Malcolm X reading room and they want an African American history curriculum and the next thing you know, the cops are patrolling the halls. Well, now it's just a thing. And when it becomes a thing, then kids get records. And when they get records, they can never get out of the system. We now have countless relationships between the DA's office and the Department of Education. And it just goes on. Um, zero tolerance, of course, then also means no lower graduation rates. And we know that if you don't graduate from high school, your chances of going into prison are pretty much there, right? They are assured. I always share this picture because I want to remind us when I'm talking about children, I really am talking about children. This was a case, I believe, out of the Bronx, not just a few years ago. Fight on the school playground over $5. Again, a thing that kids have always done, time immemorial. This kid gets taken away in a paddy wagon. You can see here he is handcuffed to a bar in the police station where he sits for a very long time before he has parents alerted or anyone to represent him. So we are talking about children and a system that is, uh, touches everybody's life. The fallout from this, as we are finally, I think, with all of the caveats that, that Ruthie rightfully gives us, um, is, is devastating. Um, one of the fallouts, and this is what I started this little section of the talk, is the devastation of communities and the devastation of neighborhoods. Um, you know, you're, you're, we're driving through Newark. I'm from Detroit. There's parts of Detroit. I used to teach in North Philly. And you just drive through those places and you're like, what? What just happened here? Right? I mean, this is like we're in a war. What just happened? Right? Buildings and, you know, there's no lights on and things are falling apart and there's a lot of kids, but there's no grown up. Like, what happened here? Right? Mass incarceration happened here. And we have a name for those places, those spaces. We call them million dollar blocks. Some of you have heard this phrase before because it ostensibly costs a million dollars to lock up everybody on that block. First of all, it should not be multi million dollar blocks. This is a complete misnomer. But this just is, gives us a visualization of what it means to have spaces criminalized. And I want to fast forward to a slide. I want to come back to my million dollar block slide. But I first want to show you this slide. Because when we're talking about million dollar blocks, we are talking about the most intensely hyper-policed criminalized blocks in America. This is Los Angeles. These are gang injunction zones which essentially means the most hyper-police, the most intensely surveyed areas. You'll notice, that if you can see close enough, these are um, 72 neighborhoods. These are overwhelmingly neighborhoods of color. And what is more, by designating them as these gang injunction zones, it means that anything goes. Surveillance goes, wiretapping goes, any kind of communication between police and other public service officials goes. And it also means that if you've got four guys hanging out on a corner and one makes a really foolish decision to steal a bike, which all young men make foolish decisions to steal bikes, when they're here, they're in a gang, they get a gang enhancement sentence, which sends them away for an additional 20 years for that bike. When they're in Ann Arbor, where I teach, they're fraternity boys and they, uh, you know, what? Maybe not even community service. So million dollar blocks determine everything. This is Detroit where I live, and I just want to make a point about this because this is the east side of Detroit, formerly one of the most kind of vibrant sides of Detroit, even though I'm a west sider, I'll have to acknowledge it here <laughs> because near the twain shall meet east side and west side in Detroit. One in 22 people under some form of correctional control. 
Brewer Park, one neighborhood on the east side of Detroit, one in 16 people under some form of correctional control. So those blocks that we're driving through and we're like, what happened here, right? We, what happened, we have orphan children. Generations of children whose parents have been ripped out of their homes. By the way, generations of traumatized children. I heard this story, um, a very apocryphal story, which I always repeat because it still sticks with me today. Uh, a police official was telling a friend of mine who's an attorney this story, and they were talking about drug busts, and they said, you know, when we do drug busts now, we come in, we now we have to bring a sheet. What, bring a sheet? What, are you bring? what, what is that about? Why do we have to bring a sheet? Well, because, you know, a lot of people have dogs, and the first thing we have to do when we bust through the do door is we have to shoot the dog, and the sight of the dog bleeding out is so traumatizing to the children that it creates such chaos in the house that it's hard to even do what we're doing, so now we bring a sheet. And I tell that story not to be graphic, or to, to I mean, it, it's because it encaptures, right, what we mean about the trauma that this has done to communities. And then we might say, well, you know, then their parents shouldn't sell drugs. You know, pretty simple. Say yes or say no to drugs. But of course, those million dollar blocks are permanently unemployable blocks. So mass incarceration has also created a crisis of joblessness and poverty. Folks aren't gonna get hired. They can't go to school to get an education in most institutions because they are barred from federal financial aid. They can't live in a dorm if they are young enough and inclined to do it anyway. They can't go to school. They can't get a job. And we know that within something like two weeks after leaving prison, if you don't have a place to sleep and something to eat, you will so-called recidivate, which is, I call it eat and sleep, or find the means to sleep and eat. So this is a crisis that is so devastatingly economic. And in our country, what about welfare? If you worked hard to find a job and you tried to better yourself and get into blah, 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 get what? No, because not only do we have these relationships between, right, the schools and the criminal justice system, we now have linked the welfare system to the criminal justice system. And so we create this horrendous and vicious cycle of trauma in communities across America. Now, we know this if we are at all connected with this community, but America should have been waking up to this a long time ago because actually the reach of this carceral state is far bigger than the people most intimately scarred by it. You know, we have such a serious prison overcrowding problem that we have created a public health crisis that affects every human being walking in this country. We had a TB epidemic in New York that was traced directly to Rikers Island. When you go into the hospital in Texas, you know, you see the signs all over the hospitals, even probably here, they say, beware of MRSA. You know, MRSA, the antibiotic resistant strain of bacteria. Well, the thing about diseases is you can do things like trace it through DNA and blah, blah, blah. And what do they find in Texas? Well, hmm, MRSA is coming straight out of the Texas prison system because they're so money saving that they're treating people who need antibiotics for a regimen of five days or less. So you're talking about an enormous Petri dish where you are breeding antibiotic resistant strains of bacteria that affect the public health of the entire nation. So what I say to folks is it doesn't matter if you're connected intimately or not, everybody, this is everybody's trauma, this is everybody's crisis. If you're a school teacher, Upwards of 30% of your classroom is probably suffering some form of PTSD from this system. So this is the long reach of the carceral state. And it has also affected our economy, and it, we should rethink our economy in that way. We have created a class of permanently unemployable people, and then we further criminalize them because they can't get a job. It is illogical, it is immoral, it is unjust. And by the way, we also have upped exploitation exponentially. 
And Ruthie and I both work on prison labor. We disagree a little bit on what the impact would be of prison labor. But I do think there's something worth thinking about in terms of the links between when we lock people up and when we further try to exploit them. Because again, we've been here before. Right after the American Civil War, we criminalize black spaces and turn prisons from all white to all black. The next thing we do is we put folks to work. Now, it is true that in terms of prison labor today in this country, there's a lot of discussion and debate about what impact it actually has on our GDP or our GMP. Um, I want to make the argument, though, that it does matter. And it matters because, well, and it did matter to capitalists. They, in fact, worked very hard in the 70s to reverse all barriers to prisoner labor that had been put in place during the New Deal, particularly because the labor movement back then said, wait a minute now, we don't want the job competition, right? And so it isn't so much how, to me anyway, it isn't so much how much prison labor we have. It is the impact of having prison labor on our psyche, on wage dampening in other professions, and I do think it matters, for example, that we now are fighting wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, and even the military-industrial complex that used to provide jobs on the outside is now being built in federal prisons. So Kevlar vests, for example, now being built, by, built in federal prisoners. And it does matter, I think, that private industry can access prison labor, although I agree that we don't know anywhere near enough about what the impact of this has been. But the bottom line of this impact is that we have created a situation that human beings can profit from, even if it's not the building or the running of the prison. It is the servicing of this beast that we call mass incarceration. Everything from tampons to tasers to telephones, right? It is the exploitative extraction of resources from public coffers and from human beings to pay for people's containment in cages. And what it literally means is that countless businesses now in America have to hope that somebody gets harmed, either robbed or murdered or raped or thrown up against the wall for low-level drugs to lose their freedom for another 20 years. They have to hope that there is a cost, that there is a social harm, so that beds are filled, so that medical transport needs to be delivered, so that meals need to be served, so that the Aramark Corporation can serve neutral loaf to people in solitary confinement, because yes, they sell that as a product. And so we are talking about an urban and labor crisis as well. This is a working class issue. And we need to tell the labor movement that it's a working class issue. Um, so I want to wrap this up. I told you. Um, by asking a question, which is if all this is true and we are now waking up and smelling this coffee, then why haven't we changed it? Or why aren't we doing something a little bit more aggressively right now to change it than we are? Well, there's some really interesting things in here. Because really what I want to ask is, why haven't the people most affected by this had, to date, a particularly effective voice in changing this? I mean, you're talking about 65 million people with a record, 7 million people still trapped in the system. That's a whole lot of people that presumably right, could weigh in on this public policy and say, you know what, not only is it not working for my communities, it is destroying the community. Well, the dirty secret of mass incarceration is that it has built into it its own safety switch, its own kind of uh, ability to uh, continue. And again, this too has a 19th century corollary. Because after the Civil War, we criminalized black spaces, we put black folks in jail in record numbers, we put them to work, and then we took away their right to vote. We fundamentally distorted democracy. We've done it again. And what are we talking about here? Well, we're talking about two things. Firstly, we're talking about felon disfranchisement. Notably, after the Civil War, this was challenged. It takes many years to undo a lot of this disfranchisement law, but it was much of it undone. And then we get mass incarceration, and suddenly people start to 
take away the vote again, and this gets challenged at the Supreme Court level. The Supreme Court says in 1974 it's perfectly legal to take away people's right to vote in perpetuity for having had a criminal conviction, and by 2006, 48 out of 50 states had some form of disfranchisement on the books, which effectively meant, and especially if you overlay what this means for the black vote, this is a terribly old slide, I want to get an updated one for 2000. Um, uh, 10 for the census, but what this means for disfranchisement is catastrophic. And this is one of the way, reasons, by the way, that when the people most affected by this have begun to speak, it hasn't been through the ballot box. It's been in Baltimore and Ferguson and in Chicago and in Detroit, and it's been in the streets. And that's in part because, right, if we can't vote, we're still going to speak. The other reason why this is shut down is because of the census. And I know a lot of you know this, but please allow me for those of you who do not to spell this out. The US Census counts people where they are locked up, not where they really live. And prior to mass incarceration, while that might not have been great, it really was not that significant for the outcome of elections. With mass incarceration, this matters a lot. We call this prison gerrymandering, and what it means is that you get locked up in Detroit, but you get sent to Ionia County, which is all white, Republican, likes drug laws, likes to build prisons, and you can't vote, but they get your body for census population. Can I hear it again for the 19th century in the three-fifths clause? Right? So you look at a state like Pennsylvania that I just moved from, and eight, count them, eight House districts only meet the minimum federal population requirements for District E because they count prisoners. So this literally means that not only can you not vote against this, but you have literally just given more power to somebody else to vote against you. And by the way, this is also a resource issue because in many communities, the census is also determining how much money you get for schools, how much money you're getting for childhood nutrition, right? So this is huge. So what about us? And this is where I'm going to leave us. So I've just explained the barriers to folks in the system to undo it. And again, make no mistake about it, people are still speaking. It's one of the reasons why that bipartisan summit moment is here, and it's because you know, folks with power get a little nervous. Don't want Chicago on fire. Don't want Baltimore to happen in Newark. Don't want it to come to Cleveland, right? So people are speaking. But what about everybody else? What about those of us who have access to the ballot box? What about those of us who could also go out on the streets and march and join? What about everybody else? Well, I started with the little, you know, I, I had that slide about, you know, who commits the most crime in America. The other dirty little secret here is that a lot of Americans are now faced with the crisis of mass incarceration, but secretly, they're kind of like, yeah, but I think it's working. You know, I can go to Times Square now with my daughter, and I can get a Swatch watch, and I can, like, go in Toys R Us, and I can go on the roller coaster. And I kind of, you know, it's kind of feeling safe and it's feeling good. And, you know, gentrification, I know it gets a bad rap, but, you know, I kind of like a Starbucks down the street. There is this kind of way in which the dirty secret is that people think that mass incarceration has made us safer. And while it kind of bothers folks to see little Wilson Reyes there with his arm attached to a wall, you know, a lot of American voters never have to meet Wilson Reyes, so really they don't have to worry about it. But here's the deal. Mass incarceration does not make us safer. This is another one of these issues that scholars, that the community knew, but scholars are just now putting some verbs in those sentences and some crossing those T's and dotting those I's. Mass incarceration does not make us safer. What we now know is that the incarceration rate has gone from zero to 100 overnight, straight up. The crime rate has gone like this. And criminologists will talk day in and day out about the complexity of the crime rate and why it goes up and why it goes down. But interestingly, we know that it tends to go down when we do tend to invest in communities, and it tends to go up when we don't. Hmm. 
But here's what we do know. I don't want to even talk about the crime rate because the crime rate is a complete social construction. What's a crime today, clearly, I hope we have shown, was not a crime yesterday and might not be a crime tomorrow. I don't even want to talk about crime. I want to talk about violence. Inner city violence is high. And that shouldn't surprise you. It shouldn't be because there's anything wrong with anyone living in the city per se. It's because mass incarceration has destroyed so many communities. And when you take away people's food and their shelter and their parents and shoot their dog, you traumatize people and you make it so that communities fray. And so some of our most traumatized incarcerated communities are also some of our communities suffering the most violence right now. And that is not coincidental. So when I'm in Times Square and I'm digging on the swatch watch that I just bought, the fact of the matter is we didn't solve anything. We just moved that into Bed-Stuy. We just shoved that down the road. And so when we talk about mass incarceration, uh, making, mass incarceration making us safer, we got to do some truth telling. It is not making us safer. It is traumatizing communities with violence. And the fact of the matter is we shouldn't be surprised. And I want to leave us with that last graph that I gave us on the murder rate and when it was high and when it was low. The murder rate was pretty staggering in the 20s and the 30s. Hmm, wonder why. We had prohibition. We had criminalized space in other ways then, and of course, Khalil Muhammad's brilliant work on this is going to you know, give us a different, a new, some new insight into what all that meant for the criminal justice system. But here's what I want to say. If you criminalize something and there's no other jobs, all of a sudden, whoa, you got guns, and you got to defend illegal turf, and you have, a, you have created the recipe for violence and prisons and excessive policing. And the final thing I want to say is when we talk about inner city violence, we are not just talking about the folks in it that are suffering because the guys got the gun and the, the beef went wrong over a drug deal. No, we're talking about the excessive policing in communities that has upped violence as well. And by the way, I also do a lot of talks with cops and what they will tell you is, you know, they get it, they, they understand. Your job is to go out there on a daily basis and throw people up against the walls and pat them down for low level drugs. It is crazy. It doesn't make any sense. A cops in this organization called Law Enforcement Against Prohibition will tell you, you know, you just clear out the drugs and more. It's not safe for them. It's not safe for people in the community. And if you look at some of the most noteworthy police shootings in recent months, there's something very interesting about all of them. Every one of them happened as a result of low-level harassment implementation of the carceral state policing. So Eric Garner, if you listen to the video, that horrific video of his murder, we have focused on him saying, I can't breathe. But if you actually listen to that video a little bit earlier, what he says, and he says it several times is, why are you guys harassing me? Why are you guys hassling me? I am trying to make a living here because he was selling Lucy's, individual cigarettes, because poor folks often can't buy a whole pack of cigarettes, and we're, again, we're talking about addiction here. Well, the thing is, is where I teach at the University of Michigan, every corner store sells Lucy's to college students, because college students are also broke. But nobody's throwing those kids up against a wall and nobody is sending them away, and certainly nobody's getting in a chokehold and dying. So we got to revisit our thought process about what it is that's working and what isn't working, and really recognize that this is the civil rights crisis of the 21st century. Thank you. <laughs>